Hello and welcome. Alex here from Digital Foundry. Owing to such a positive response to our video covering Crisis, we thought it would be good today to look back at its sequels and spread over two videos. So in today's portion, we will be looking back here at some of the technological changes introduced in the Crisis series over time since Crisis 2, a game which at its time of release represented something that was almost unthinkable, that untamable beast, Crisis on consoles at last. So given that, and a couple other things that we'll come to talk about, I think it can be said in general that the series transition into the second game came with some changes that may have not been so great. To discuss this and just reminisce about the old days, I'm joined by my friend and colleague, John Linneman. Hey John, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, Alex, and I am most certainly ready to discuss Crisis. Awesome, so let's get started. And the best way I thought would be to lead into this discussion about Crisis 2 would actually be to talk about our experience with the first game. Because Crisis 1's entire existence flavors the reception around Crisis 2, both technologically and in terms of how it plays. This is true. John, like, what was your first experience with Crisis 1? What were you expecting in 2007? And really important, did you build your own PC for that game? So yeah, obviously the hype for Crisis was huge at the time because the tech demos just looked kind of insane. And I mean, they even went so far as to tease like the last level of the game, if I recall, at maybe yeah. one of the E3 uh, uh, demonstrations, which was kind of nuts. But either way, yes, I was excited and I did build a rig just for that PC. Before that, I was still using a Pentium 4 3.6 gigahertz, mm -hmm. which uh, I tried to run Crisis on. It didn't work. <laughs> Not very well. So oh, yeah, I have a story to tell there. Yeah. Great. Okay. So so yeah. So I built a new PC. I went with the Intel E6750, uh, 2.66 gigahertz. It was a dual core, mm -hmm. and I paired that up with the venerable 8800 GT graphics card from Nvidia, which is a legendary card. I feel. Oh, completely, utterly. And uh, so yeah, were you, were you happy at least with your performance when you got the game? So the thing about Crisis, I guess, is yeah, it's very demanding. Um, I did like a lot of people, and I played in DX9 mode, but with mm -hmm. the motion blur enabled, which resulted in lots of glitches on certain objects, like but still good. vehicles, and but it was still good enough. And yeah, it looked great. Um, I kind of got in the 30s and 40s on average, which weirdly enough, I mean. That drives me nuts now, and with a controller I can't deal with it, but the combination of really good motion blur plus a mouse look in Crisis somehow it never bothered me that much. And I played it on an NEC CRT and on my Pioneer Plasma from that year, which was actually still a 1366 by 768 panel. Yeah, yeah. I did something so completely similar, it's amazing. Um, for me, I was also... Like, to just get a sense of it, um, the lead-up to Crisis 1 coming out was a huge technological showcase. Every single thing that demonstrated the game constantly talked about how it was the best-looking game ever made, how it was something from the future, and how it would run like something with the from the future. So, funnily enough, even though I'm such a graphics tech nerd, I originally played the Crisis 1 demo on an you know, a rather old Pentium 4, 3.4 gigahertz HT processor with three gigabytes of RAM and an X8800 XT. So I played on the very lowest settings at around 20 FPS. And I played on a 66 or a 6800 GT. Yeah, yeah. So you at least technically could have gotten shadows. I didn't. Uh, <laughs> um, but to say the least, that psyched me enough for the game, even though it looked atrocious, worse than Far Cry, arguably, on my PC. It was just something so futuristic to think that my three-year-old PC was just utterly humbled by this game. And when I, when the game eventually came out, I immediately, uh, after playing the demo, grabbed up the money on my way to go into university and grabbed it an 8800GT SLI rig with a Q6600 and uh, probably four gigabytes of RAM running Windows 64, at least Windows Vista 64-bit at the time, and it just blew me away. Sure, it ran really poorly, and at the time there was, you know, micro stuttering, which only I only saw it once actually lined up with a, a monitor of a friend of mine's who had an 8800 GTX, uh. and I could actually see the micro stuttering. We were wondering what the heck it was, but um, so, you know, you learn a lesson there regarding SLI. But the whole point is that Crisis 1 came out, and it kind of was something from the future, ran like something from the future, and 
set a precedent at that point in time, I think, for the Crisis series and what CryEngine would represent that kind of stood in the mind of PC gamers at the time. Yeah, and I, I gotta interject and say that, honestly, looking back, I do believe that Crisis is one of my favorite games of all time. Yeah, I'm gonna throw it out there too. Crisis is one of my favorite games of all time. It's really good. I mean, people always talk, oh, it's just graphics, but no, there's so much more to it, and it's excellent. So, as you say then, the move to Crisis 2 was certainly an unexpected turn. Yeah, yeah, right. So the lead up to Crisis 1 was the intense focus on PC and how it was something from the future. And 2009 rolls around, GDC, and the first video to show off hints of what Crisis 2 would be was a GDC demonstration of the revealed CryEngine 3. Uh, and also SIGGRAPH in that same year showing off features of that engine. And CryEngine 3 was different. Instead of going immediately for the jugular, so to speak, it started to show off console footage as the first thing we could see of this new engine. Crisis 1 sold, but not well enough. And Crisis 1 was pirated extremely heavily, which is extremely famous by this point in time, uh, how often it was quoted by Shavat Yearly and co. Uh, it makes sense to demonstrate an engine running on something that sells a lot for an engine's perspective, right? Like, you have to sell this engine, right? Sure, yeah. Uh, so it does make a lot of sense, but it was also coming off the backs of Crisis 1 where we thought the next iteration of CryEngine would be just as monumental a leap forward. It was a strange thing to look at, like, oh, these textures and this resolution and this performance is really poor in this demonstration video. Um, it, it just didn't like flow with the preconceived notion of what a Crisis game was or what a CryEngine should be uh, at that point in time, I think. And you know, this engine though, even in its initial debut, was showing off amazing things that hadn't been done in, you know, at least in the CryEngine before, and also in real-time rendering in general. This is true. You had things like the switch to deferred lighting in the engine moving away from forward lit, which gave way for the ability for Crisis 2 to have city levels where you could actually have artificial lighting scattered across the screen, if not dozens or hundreds of individual point lights, something that was not at all possible in CryEngine 2 or in Crisis 1 really without severe performance penalties and generally didn't look nearly as good. You had things like real-time global illumination being shown off at SIGGRAPH and also technically in the GDC demo itself, where not on the console versions necessarily, but you would actually have real light bounds uh, from you know individual light sources technically with the virtual point light system or you would have it just from the sun with indirect lighting as well, like an indirect shadowing and indirect specular reflections too in more advanced versions of the GI solution. It was just something that we hadn't seen before, but it was showing it off in the context of consoles right. where it wasn't being utilized to its fullest. And I think that already flavored a lot of the expectations for the soon to be announced Crisis 2, and then shortly thereafter in 2010 with a variety of videos, a variety of technological demonstrations of the game, once again really hearkening home at the fact that it would be a console game. We hadn't really seen much PC footage at this point of both CryEngine 3 and Crisis 2. Um, still those videos were showing off wonderful things like deformation on vehicles and deformation on a metal or awesome hit reactions from enemy AI. They also showed off the things like bokeh depth of field which was kind of becoming a hot thing at the at that point. Oh yeah like, like you had basically the fact that they were showing off these things that you had expected as being high-end PC features or high-end graphics that you expect on a PC were coming to consoles. Sure, in these videos that they were showing them often, uh, the frame rate was actually really poor usually, uh, kind of notoriously so, and uh, you know, they hadn't finished a lot of the game engine stuff and a lot of the game itself to make it really look great. So this was all coloring everyone's expectations of Crisis 2 before it came out, with Crisis 1 looming in the background. And I, I remember very specifically that they had really only been showing off what were co considered console settings for the longest period of time. And then there was a, a leaked PC beta version of the game in 2011, I believe, before it came out. I didn't ever actually get to try it out. Um, but I heard a lot about it, that it was going to be DX9 and it didn't scale graphical options. It had like one option in the menu. 
And it terrified me, actually, <laughs> because you're coming, in, you're coming in from Crisis One, which has, you know, not uh, an amazing Crow Team level style of, you know, options, graphical options, but you still had, you know, really good stuff. You could control, like, your strength of motion blur. You had at least four different settings. They all were rather different, too, uh, which is something we're going to talk about later when we get into Crisis Two itself. But you had basically a lot of things before Crisis Two had even come out that were from the views of someone who plays PC games and viewed Crisis 1 as some sort of pinnacle of PC gaming, um, it was a bit sad and a little bit uh, worrisome. So then Crisis 2 came out. Um, and at this point in time, um, I had only seen the game on consoles before, John. What was it like for you? Like, Did you play it initially on PC or on console? I played it initially on the PC. Okay, yeah, I, I did too. Um, I had before that purposely acquired a friend's Xbox 360 to play the beta. Oh, oh yeah, that's true. Which uh, I was kind of excited about uh, just because I couldn't believe I was seeing these graphical effects on console of a Crisis game. Uh, it didn't run very well necessarily, but... Um, it was still really interesting, but as the game released on PC, um, I was both really happy and really sad at the same time. It was different this time around, though. Unlike the time before it, I did not build a PC just for Crisis 2. You know, I, did you, John? Uh, um, I had built a PC very recently, but it was not specifically for Crisis 2. Right. That, for, for me, it was very similar. I had built a PC in the year preceding. But it wasn't for Crisis 2, it was just because it was that time again. Now, the, th the thing though is that I feel like Crisis 2 had a different impact because it did look excellent at launch. Oh yeah, yeah. But because of its lower requirements in targeting consoles, it was very easy to achieve 60 frames per second with the DX9 renderer that it shipped with. Which is great. So yeah, my first experience with the game was playing through all of it at a locked 60 frames per second and it just looked fantastic, I thought. That's exactly what I did. I played through it on a uh, NVIDIA GTX 470 SLI rig uh, on a Core i7-930 at that point in time. And I, it was just a lock 60 through the entire way through, probably with tons of headroom as well. The initial release of Crisis 2 on PC was DX9 only, had like originally three presets for graphical options that ended up leaving a lot of the graphical, you know, visual identity of the game intact, but just kind of made it lower fidelity the more you kept going down, like reducing the resolution of things, reducing the sample counts and things like that. It was just a very different mindset about the way the game would function on PC. And it looked great and it ran great, but it wasn't this kind of meteoric, wonderful, you know, future version of a game that Crisis 1 was. It still, you know, it, it didn't ship with like parallax exclusion mapping, it didn't ship with the latest API support, and it didn't, you know, have all those, even it was missing graphical features that Crisis 1 had. And that's the kind of stuff you saw online at that time, people complaining about, which is sad, I think, but uh, reasonable yeah. at the same time, too, from those expectations that Crisis 1 set, almost. Of course, you know, it still had its own niceties and improvements. Oh, yeah. I mean, as I said, the, the depth of field was great. It featured a, a much more inclusive version of motion blur that I think looked absolutely excellent. It actually works, you know, like on a per pixel level now. So exactly. when you walk forward, you can actually see it moving with you. It looks really good. You, you've got, uh, at least on PC, which was turned off by the console versions, which we'll talk about in a second, you've got a, the, an implementation of the global illumination system that yep. they'd, they'd been developing for the game. There's a lot of other smaller things that it does really, really well, but in general, like it just wasn't that height that we had come to expect of a Crisis series, which flavored the entire experience for a lot of people but then you kind of look at the console versions and john you have much more experience with me here uh, i've just been going over the footage recently again and it's a good looking game on consoles i don't think that can not be said of it it is a very good looking game it's using all those graphical features that the pc version shipped with minus like something like you know just like a better looking ssao and you know the global illumination but it's still really good looking uh, John, what was your impression when you played the, the console versions of the game? So I always felt that it was an interesting target in that you're right. It used to, a lot of the features that you would expect from the PC version. So, but at the same time, it definitely felt like a game that wasn't fully optimized for console play. Whereas, you know, the frame rate is just not good enough, to be honest, on either version, right? It, it's it's I would use the word atrocious. Actually, it is atrocious. It's, it's it's really bad. It's really bad. <laughs> so, you know, there were other top tier shooters on those consoles at the time. Killzone Two had already been released. Uh, I think 
Killzone 3 may have been out at that point as well. I can't remember the launch date for that. Yep, not even a month earlier, in fact. Crisis 2 launched in March of 2011, and Killzone 3 launched in the month before, so February that year, yeah. Like you're saying, you already had great looking yeah. with modern feature yes. sets, shooters that were 30 FPS and they maintained it for the most part. Exactly. And so Crisis 2 comes along and it does look good. It's comparable to a other high-end console games, but the resolution was much lower and the frame rate was extremely poor. Yeah, just looking over at this scene right now, this is basic gameplay, by the way, with no AI being activated. You can already see that there's problems in that FPS graph. Uh, one, the game's frame pacing is off the entire time. I think... Yep. I'm not exactly certain if it's this exact same way for this console version of CryEngine, but the FPS limiter in Engine doesn't actually limit based upon when the next refresh rate would be for your display, so it always missyncs actually if you limit it to 30. And in the case of this game, it's never actually going to have a steady frame time graph, which I think, I mean, even with the motion blur, I still think it's actually pretty visible in this case, and it doesn't look great. Yeah, it looks extremely jittery. It's a jittery looking game, and then you get into combat. Yeah. And the FPS tanks, no matter what. I mean, it's a little bit worse on average on PS3 in general, but then as soon as you get in combat, Xbox 360 basically almost halves its frame rate at some points. And like here, you can see the PS3 CPU advantage is making it run a little bit faster, but still, you know, frame rates in the teens here. This is nothing we would actually think of as being good these days. And yet this is a release product for a game. No, it's not. That was actually surprisingly common last generation. If you go back and revisit a lot of so-called big shooters, it's, yeah. it's surprising how poor they are now. Like I popped in that Medal of Honor reboot that EA did during that period. It's, and it's an Unreal Engine 3 game and the frame rate is just awful. I mean, it's even worse than this. It wow. never stops tearing. <laughs> so, I mean, the fact that big games like this were being released with such poor performance, it really shows to me that this generation is a dramatic improvement overall in terms of what you can expect on a console. We were, we were just talking about this, John. Like, uh, this is a case of almost priorities gone wrong. It's wonderful that it has this great feature set that is also in other high-end games and even on the PC, I guess, in some ways. But... If the frame rate is so low and it becomes unplayable or just unenjoyable to play or visually nauseous almost, um, it's not good stuff. And I think also in general, there's a couple other visual elements in the game on the console versions that are like very strange. I really like that they have the post-processing in the game that you see, you know, motion blur is awesome. I'm a huge motion blur fan. Yeah, yeah. But they changed like the bloom and the color saturation and color grading rather often in the game. So it kind of has this hazy, oversaturated look the entire time, which is the exact opposite of Crisis 1. Yeah, exactly. Crisis 1 was more for like limited, toned down post-processing in terms of color grading and bloom. So it always looked a little, I don't know, Michael Bay-ish version of what Crisis would be. Well, I kind of feel like it's uh, it's that J.J. Abrams style like lens yeah. flare effect like everywhere. They did implement per pixel lens flares technically for that version of the engine as well too, going above and beyond Crisis 1. Uh, which they eventually ripped out for Crisis 3, which will be talked about in the next video. Um, but it just kind of gave this... It looked very similar in color palette and style to other games around its time, almost. Uh, which is, you know, which Crisis wasn't about kind of following the pack, it was more about leading it. And that kind of also goes down into the other areas of the game design and engine design as well, too. The game engine itself now calculates things differently, and it has like kind of a large effect on the way game spaces are developed, just because the necessities of consoles, I guess, existing there, they needed to have it run well on consoles, fit into the limited memory that consoles would have. And it kind of pushed some of the game design also in that direction where other shooters had to do that, yes. that were more console-based shooters. You have things like the vertex positions, that is, the vertexes that make up geometry, their positions were now stored in a 16-bit format, floating point format, instead of 32-bit. And now that sounds very mundane. Yeah, but if you're making large levels for a game, this lack of precision in that data format makes it so that they can basically not be doable because larger single piece objects have problems they deform and don't look right anymore at a large scale <laughs> it starts to look like kingpin it starts looks like kingpin yeah it starts <laughs> to look like kingpin um and you know this is like all things which from an engine designs perspective which was made around consoles existing as this wasn't a problem necessarily on pc 
and it showed it, it kind of affected the at least for my perspective the the modding and dev community around the engine CryEngine 3 when it came out on PC people were pretty disappointed in the fact that we couldn't be making these larger levels now and it affected their design workflow and things like that yeah, and beyond that, it, it did impact the ability to create large Crisis-style maps. But if you even wanted to create Crisis 2-style maps, just the nature of a city environment suddenly makes asset creation uh, a more difficult uh, proposition, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can make a rolling terrain and use a bunch of bespoke tree models everywhere, and it can still look nice, right? You can do something with that. You can maybe import your own models for certain bits and pieces of the level, but... In a city, I feel like it's just more demanding to create mm -hmm. anyway. So, like, I, f I feel like th these aspects together kind of uh, killed some of the enthusiasm in the Crisis community for working on the game. Yeah, yeah. It was just this time where AAA development kind of made it impossible now to actually be modding games right. <laughs> One thing is that, you know, Alex, you mentioned about vertex positions using uh, half floats, essentially. This is something that's come back a lot today, and I think a lot of people might be like, wait a minute, I've heard about FP16 recently, and that is more in reference to a shader precision. And in that case, you know, the idea is to perform it in a FP16, use half floats for a shader, in which case precision is not necessary, right? So you would only use it on shaders where it doesn't have a necessarily a visual impact on the effect. But when you apply this to vertex positions, obviously it has a much more far reaching uh, consequence to some of the visual aspects of the game. So it is, it's a similar idea. It's all about saving resources. It's all about saving memory and saving processing time, which is really big on consoles, obviously. Exactly, especially with games that feature a lot of animation, the animation just eats up so much memory. And on these consoles, you were limited to very low amounts of memory, especially on PlayStation 3 with its split memory configuration, where you have 256 megs of system RAM and 256 megs of VRAM. And trying to run a game like this within that sort of limited memory pool, you know, you have to make sacrifices. And that's one of the ways I believe they chose to sort of increase the certain aspects of the game to allow for additional variety but it has that nasty side effect yeah it, it, it made sense for the for the, the scope that crisis 2 was but it almost like limited the way people could use the engine itself or just precisely like the effect on level design itself here too based upon those consoles you had now the largest you know even the smallest level in crisis 1 feels and has like much more larger play area in it than you know, the largest level of Crisis 2. It doesn't make those levels in Crisis 2 necessarily bad or poorly designed. It's just a different design that people didn't expect of a Crisis game, and it really flavored their entire opinion on it all. Which I, I think is a little bit unfortunate in some ways, because I actually think Crisis 2, I think it's let down by the AI more than anything else. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's good enough. But the level design at its core is generally quite well done. And, and what I mean here is, I believe that Crisis 2 subscribes to the same formula that you might have found in like a Metal Gear game where, or even Deus Ex, where essentially you're presented with a, a limited scope playground. You have a stage with a number of different paths and options for getting through it, but you're ultimately still on a linear path. So it's freedom within linearity. And so it creates these spaces that are fun to play around in. And they're large enough that you feel like you have freedom, but they're not so large that you're just like aimlessly wandering around. And it doesn't give you that feeling of open world, which honestly, at this point, I feel is kind of a benefit where, you know, at the same time, I do think Crisis also kind of straddled that line because it was much larger, but it never went into full blown open world territory, thankfully, never because it still purpose, it still felt no. carefully crafted. But still, in that sense, I do think Crisis 2 works fairly well and that you have these crafted semi-open levels that are neat to explore and honestly if it wasn't for the poor ai uh namely it's like when they discover you the way they react and fire at you it's just not satisfying compared to other games that maybe did it better yeah i think i think you have a good point i also think crisis 2 has some of those areas that open up but a lot of the design was kind of this may sound a, a bit sacrilege but it's almost doom 2016 like as in the fact that you open you enter an arena where there's you know a playable space that is sandboxy 
then the enemy characters come out and you deal with them in a certain way. And the yep. whole point was to let you use your nano suit and whatnot and your you know customizing weapons to deal with the enemy AI in that way. But the only problem was at least the soldier AI and the alien AI, they could have done a lot differently there, I think, <laughs> to make it much more fun to play. Unlike in Doom, where you have this incredibly large bestiary making it really fun to always move around and you know interact with in crisis you had bipedal covenant clones almost essentially yes so but moving over from the enemy ai maybe not reacting as well one thing that crisis 2 did well on all the platforms it released on was at least animations for those ai itself the way they react when they're hit and the way your own guns themselves are animated so much owing to, I think, releases like Killzone 2 before it, Crisis 2 added in much more customized hit reactions for when enemy AI is hit by the bullets you're shooting at them. So they'll rebound off of walls, they'll grab their legs and ankles, they'll fall over each other, they'll do a lot of really cool things just to make it look like they're actually panicking around as they're getting shot at. And also, uh, they added a lot of bespoke animations for specific actions, which, you know, when you stealth kill an enemy, or you activate a switch of some sort. They do a lot of first-person camera work that I felt was always a little bit lacking. Like, Crisis 1 has good animation, but interactions with the environment didn't necessarily feel connected in the, in the same way. You know what I mean? It was more telegraphed. Uh, and the one really cool thing that you're talking about, specialized animations for when you're stealth or not, is this is a little animation detail that I'm not sure who thought it up, but it's actually genius. Is Depending upon what suit mode you're in, the reload animations for all your weapons are actually different. So for example, when you're in strength mode, your character, Alcatraz, will rip out the magazine and slam it back in and pull back the hammer. Or if you're in just normal mode, he'll just reload it normally. Or if you're in stealth mode, your character will pull back the hammer, gently release the magazine, putting it back in, and then silently closing the firing chamber. There's just like a lot of really cool details into the animations that advance above Crisis 1 before it, but things that are overlooked, I think, in time because the souring, the souring of opinion on Crisis 2 already happened. People didn't really appreciate the things that it did do really well yeah and i think the general the feel of the weapons is really well done like you know bringing up the iron sights popping off a few shots the animation work and the sound work everything about that just feels extremely well done and i feel like that is one of those things where i would love to see a you know a proper cryengine 3 version of uh, the original crisis with some of these would be so nice. uh, quality of life improvements as you might call them applied to that version yeah yeah i think another thing is you mentioned sound and these quality of life improvements you also have the wonderful score and sounds by hans zimmer in this game yeah the music is great you know that awesome menu music or as you're just going around the city these kind of like little musical flares that pop up here and then it's much more musically driven game than than crisis one uh and it sounds really good i mean crisis one had battle music and whatnot but it wasn't like Crisis 2's kind of dynamic ambient score. But then, you know, when you move over to PC after talking about consoles and the way they affected the game design so much, these things felt also a little wrong, I think, at the same time. Uh, as much as it is nicer to play Crisis on a controller now in Crisis 2, um, the switching over of suit, suit modes to be a more binary function is one that kind of took away tactical freedom, I think, just kind of as the necessity to make the game work always really well on a controller. I think a lot of people didn't like that as well. I actually like that. I actually feel like that's a nice way to streamline some of the actions. Or at least I wish it were easier to trigger the different suit modes uh, in Crisis 1. I mean, you can do the double tap or, or the wheel, but none of them feel quite as immediate. Yeah, I think almost if like the paddle controllers had existed then, like the Xbox Elite controller and things like that, yeah. this would not even be a thing that we'd be talking about right now. True. But <laughs> here we are. The PC version was great, but it came around at a point in time when people were expecting something different. And Crytek came around eventually with a DX11 patch, which remedied a lot of the fears about CryEngine not being forward-looking necessarily, and because it was an extremely forward-looking patch in a lot of ways, you know, adding in things like better textures, parallax occlusion mapping, tessellation, better motion blur, better-looking ocean rendering. It did a whole lot of things. 
But with this DX11 patch coming out, it still didn't assuage a lot of fears about the future of the series. Crisis 2's gameplay as well did not help that kind of appreciation that people were going to have of the game series looking forward. And no one that I really knew of was looking forward to Crisis 3 as being a revitalization of the series necessarily. But that's something we'll talk about in the next video. So, but John, before we go here, I was just wondering, is there any summary thoughts you'd have about Crisis 2, or at least CryEngine as it was at that time? Well, you know, it was interesting to see the sacrifices necessary to get this running on a console, but I kind of feel like the answer to can it run Crisis is almost a no. Yeah. Like, technically, you can play Crisis 2 and other Crisis games on these consoles, but the performance just isn't there. It really isn't good enough for this type of experience. But unfortunately, as we've seen, like, and I think a lot of people truly do forget this, last generation was not a 30 FPS generation. It was like a 20 to 25 FPS generation. A lot of big AAA games coming out from third party publishers simply didn't run well. And Crisis 2 is no exception. But at the same time, it did manage to look exceptionally nice for the console. So in that sense, you know, it, it was an impressive achievement in some ways. But I would say that they ultimately couldn't quite match um, the more customized engines designed by the first party studios specifically for the consoles. Or even like the best of Unreal Engine 3 with Gears of War 3, where it just feels so beautifully integrated with what the 360 could do. It was just very well utilized. So they were kind of caught in this difficult position then where they had to make a lot of sacrifices to achieve the game at all on consoles. But at the same time, this also meant that the PC experience was a step back. I mean, just the fact that all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's DX9 only at launch in 2011 and it's missing uh, a lot of the features and things you'd expect from Crisis. The modding support was kind of reduced in terms of what could be done for a number of reasons. Like the whole the whole experience around Crisis, it lost its identity somewhat. Like it's a good game. I think it's a much better game than people give it credit for, but it lost something. That's pretty much exactly how I feel about it and especially regarding the PC side of things. I feel that the Crisis identity was somewhat repackaged uh, and unsuccessfully on consoles because of that performance problem that we're talking about now. And it just wasn't a fit that was necessarily meant to be. Uh, maybe the next gen it could have been, who knows? But we'll talk about that more so in our Crisis 3 video. But that is for another day. For today at least, I really hope you enjoyed watching this video and John and my conversation here about Crisis 2, both what it did wrong and the things that it did at least get right. And if you did like this video, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring that little bell over there in the corner, as every little bit helps. If you want to talk about Crisis 2 or CryEngine, write a comment below, or follow John, me, and Digital Foundry on Twitter. This is Alex and John, signing off.